Our next session is back by very popular demand um, from last year. It is a session on fundraising, and it is going to be led by um, Shelly Kaziki, who has been involved with actually the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation for years, as she mentioned earlier, since her dear husband, Craig Kaziki, um, received the devastating news of his diagnosis. Um, she cared for Craig for 11 years before his lo he lost his battle to mesothelioma in April of 2009. And now she has dedicated her life to finding a cure for this disease and has taken a very active role in the mesothelioma community, including raising over a quarter of a million dollars towards research. So it's very commendable. Okay, it, somebody has lost the room key, and it's over there on the table if you've, if you've lost your room key. All right, and the next moderator is Erica Rubel, and she is the fundraising coordinator for the Miso Foundation. She is also an estate planning lawyer from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, Erica became involved in the mesothelioma community when she um, lost her dad, Lance, who was diagnosed with pleural mesothelioma on August 7th of 2007. She has taken this on as her mission in life and has really worked every day since then to contribute in the fight towards fighting mesothelioma and bringing awareness to this disease. So without further ado, here is Shelly and Erica. Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone here and also everyone at home watching on the live stream. Um, by now you know my name is Erica Rubel. I lost my dad, Lance Rubel, to pleural mesothelioma on August 16th, 2008. My dad was the strongest and brave, bravest man that I've ever known. He was my mentor, my hero, and friend. When he was diagnosed with mesothelioma, my world stopped. Our world as a family would never be the same. My dad faced the disease head on, undergoing all possible meso treatments available. He endured chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, all in only 10 months, and he passed away in 12. Life would be severely altered from that day forward. I would often ask myself, how could this disease be so lethal? How could it take my dad in only 12 months? Wanting answers, I decided to attend my first symposium in 2009 with my brother. What I realized when I went to Washington four years ago is that there were limited answers, research was scarce, and underfunded. I sat in disbelief and sometimes sadness meeting people who also lost loved ones and hearing similar stories to ours. But through this time in Washington, a fire was ignited inside of me to make a difference and turn my anger into action, to honor my dad by helping others. When I heard Shelley speak about honoring her late husband, Craig, with a MISO research grant, I was moved to do the same for my dad. For I realized that it is only through raising funds for research that we can truly help MISO patients. As I sat on the plane back to Florida, I started to think about raising funds for MISO. I never imagined in my entire life that I would be asking people to donate money ever for anything, but now I couldn't imagine not doing it. I started simply with a letter campaign on his one year anniversary, putting pen to paper, my dad's story, and I sent it to over 350 family and friends. What I received in return was overwhelming yet beautiful. The donations and notes about my dad came pouring in, and this simple letter campaign, My Dad's Story, brought in over $27,000. All of a sudden, a fundraising campaign was born, a way to honor my dad, a way for his death to help others, and a way to try and heal. In four years, our family has raised over $207,000 for mesothelioma research with two grants in my dad's name, and we are currently working on our third research grant. 
I am still amazed by all the lives my dad touched. Our efforts continue in his memory. It is my hope that in my lifetime, better treatments will be offered for MISO patients, treatments that improve quality of life and increase survival. My dad embodied the meaning of life. It is his spirit and principles that I try and emulate. It is his footsteps before me that I will always be chasing after. We all have an opportunity and a chance in life to help others. This is your chance. Whether you are a caregiver, patient, lost a loved one, a lawyer, a doctor, you can make a difference and leave your imprint on the MISO community. Now I would like to introduce Shelly, who has raised a quarter of a million dollars for MISO research. She has raised the most money as any individual for the MISO Foundation. But I gotta tell you, Shelly, I'm getting close to you, so you better watch out, because I'm on your heels. Please welcome my friend, Shelly. Thank you, Erica. My late, my late husband, Craig, lived with mes mesothelioma for 11 years. The important word I want you to hear in that sentence is lived. He worked, vacationed, and embraced life until the very end. He was a hero not only to me, but to everyone in this room. It is because of his spirit and unwavering willingness to do whatever he could to live one more day that I knew I had to do more than be just his wife and caregiver. I had to help, I had to help dig deep and, wait. <laughs> I had to help dig deep when I thought I had no energy left to give and try to help save the lives through, th through fundraising. I also knew if I couldn't save him, I might be able to extend the lives of those in the MISO community that I have come to know and love. As I call out to specific groups, I'm going to ask that you please stand and remain standing if you are able. Patients and caregivers, would you please stand? I personally know, personally know how emotionally and physically draining this disease is as I have stood in your shoes. I know devoting one more minute to anything else but getting well may seem impossible. But you may be surprised how fundraising can empower you. Please remain standing. I invite friends, family, and those of you who know someone who is battling this horrific disease to please stand. I too know the helpless feeling you have experienced or are currently experiencing as you watch your loved one endure in countless treatments and tests. Fundraising may be an outlet for you, bringing enormous support to your family or loved one. If you are here because you have lost a loved one or a dear friend or know someone that has lost their battle and are here for support, please stand. Unfortunately, I know all too well the pain that is in your hearts. It is an ache that will never go away, but one that you may keep alive through fundraising and naming a memorial grant in honor of your loved one. Attorneys, if there's an attorneys in the room, please stand. You and your clients, <clears throat> your clients come to see you in all different declines of health. I am, would like to help you raise funds, but you may not know how to get started. We have great ideas for large and small fundraisers. Luckily, my law firm has helped me and Erica's has helped her as well. It is my hope, if you have not already involved yourself, you would like to get started. Doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, and researchers, please stand. Ultimately, we are raising funds to get to you. We want as many research dollars available for the latest and greatest grants coming in for review. We want you, the doctors, to have access to the best medicines available and the nurse practitioners 
and nurses to be able to administer those medications as quickly as possible. What we ask in return is that you send your patients to the Meso Foundation so, they, that, so that they can become part of this unique community. So they are not out there alone with no support. I did that for three years before this foundation was founded and it was a very scary time. You may all sit down. Now that you have seen that just about everyone in this room has stood up, you realize how fundraising can benefit all of us at some level. I now invite you to sit back, relax, as Eric and I present Fundraising Made Easy. Because you see, without fundraising, a cure will not be found. We truly believe that with the talent in this room, we can all make a difference. Thank you. We printed out this handout for everybody. So if you didn't get one, please um, connect with Anna, who's out there in the audience, who can give you a copy of our PowerPoint so you can take notes about what we're going to be discussing. The six steps of fundraising. First, you need to pick an event type, organize the logistics, choose a venue, ask for support, include a money maker, and be sure to say thank you. We're going to go into more detail now with those. So for step one, pick an event type. We have first a letter writing campaign. Shelly and I have been very successful with our letter writing campaigns. Um, mine, like I said before, brought in over $25,000. Her also brought in thousands of dollars. It's an easy way to get started. If you're nervous about how to do your first fundraiser and how it should go, it's so simple to put your story on paper, whether you've lost a loved one, whether you're a caregiver, whether you're a patient, and send it out to your family and friends and educate them about MISO, about what's going on. And nowadays with technology, sending a letter in the mail is so much more effective than posting something on Facebook or asking people to make donations through email. There's nothing better than getting a letter in the mail and being able to sit down and read a story. And I put my dad's photo as well in the letter um, when we sent it out and we got an overwhelming uh, feedback and response. So that's an easy way um, to get started. Poker tournament. Um, our family has hosted two poker tournaments and we looked at poker because our friends and family were playing poker. So capitalize on something that you're interested in, something that your community is involved in. Uh, just a few uh, hours ago I was speaking with um, Heather Nash and she wants to do a surfing fundraiser. That's something that I would never do because I don't know any surfers, but she knows about 30 or 40 surfers. So look at who's around you and look at your community and think about what would work for you. We've been, had a very good time with poker and it's been successful for us. Walk, runs and walks and bike races, those are pretty uh, self-explanatory. Um, events within an event, very unique um, ability to make money here with that type of an event. Hone in on an event that already exists. So say you don't have the time and effort to be able to go and make your own event, but there's a walk or a race that you can piggyback onto. For example, my cousins live in New Jersey. There's a triathlon in their area every summer. So they have now gone about a group of about 20 people that participate in this annual triathlon. And even though it's set up by another facility, they are able to piggyback and bring their group and they raise money for the MISO Foundation that way. Golf tournament. Golf tournaments can be very successful. You definitely just need to be well organized and have the proper people that can help you with that. Trivia nights, mouse races, roller hockey. I do want to touch on roller hockey. 
My dad used to coach uh, roller hockey, so we decided after he passed away, my brother and I decided that we were going to host a couple of roller hockey tournaments. And we got all of the guys that used to be boys that he used to coach come out and skate. They were a lot slower now that they're in their 20s and 30s, but it was a wonderful event. It honored him. And again, focus on your audience and the people you know that could come out and support your event. And next is Quarter Mania, which is Shelly's baby. So I'm going to give that over to her so you can talk a little bit about that. Quarter Mania is probably one of the things that I make most of my money on. Um, it's actually uh, kind of a, like an auction. You sp they only spend $10 to, uh, for an entry fee. It's probably about 125 baskets that I usually get donated. I would say 80% of the items are donated. And I bring in, I average about $15,000 uh, that night. I have all the food donated. Um, and people will say I wanted to auction off this microphone. And it's, uh, I would say this microphone is 25 cents. All these people in this room, if this microphone was donated, throw in 25 cents for this microphone, and I've made profit, all profit, on this microphone for 25 cents. It's a, it's a different concept. I can talk to you after Q&A, when we have time for Q&A um, about it, but it's a fantastic moneymaker. It's a little bit of work, but um, it's, a, it's a great moneymaker and huge success um, for me every single year. Uh, this, these pictures are um, pictures of fundraisers that Eric and I have uh, both held. The one with the van is um, actually an event with an event. It's called a Ragnar race. It was a race that my family did across the whole state of Florida. Uh, it was 33 hours of running. Somebody had to be on the ground at all times. and. Um, so they raised money by sponsors, and they're, they're, they're just being goofy standing by a, <laughs> by a van. But those are my, um, my children and nieces and nephews. So um, anyway, that's an event with an event where you can raise money, and you literally don't have to do anything other than pay the sponsorship fee and then get people who know you and love you and want to sponsor a dollar a mile or 50 cents a mile or whatever and you make money and our the pictures up there of our family um in the corner there and the top is at, at a hockey tournament that is uh, my mom and brother and husband and son and a couple of guys that have helped us that my dad used to coach and they help us uh, get ring time and help us with the event um, in the bottom is us at actually uh, Larry Davis, who had peritoneal miso and unfortunately passed away recently. That's at one of his races in Boca. And then um, the picture with the three of us in the bottom is my husband and mom. And that's a community event at a local grocery store where we were able to raise awareness for mesothelioma as well as collect um, donations. Organiz Organized logistics, um, this is all really important. When you are going to do a fundraiser, you need to know um, how much time are you willing to invest. Obviously, if you're going to do a letter writing campaign, that takes a whole lot less time than a quarter mania or a roller hockey event. Um, a letter writing campaign, you can write a letter, put stamps on it, mail it off, and you're pretty much done. Um, a golf tournament, you contact the golf um, course, and they pretty much set it up for you. You just have to get your golfers in line. And that's a fairly easy one also, depending on how many other things you want to do with it, whether you want to have raffle baskets. You can make that as big and elaborate as you want. Raffle baskets, 50-50s, barbecues, all that kind of stuff. So you really have to think about how much time you want to invest in your um, event. 
dates will this interfere interfere with holidays festivals proms you really have to be careful when you're planning your event six months out um, are you going to if you're going to do it in the fall check with your schools and see if this is going to fall on homecoming because you're you could run into a problem with all the young people and the parents are not going to want to come if it's their children's senior homecoming dance. They're going to, you just have to be very careful when you pick your date. Be realistic on the dates. Um, I know Erica had a problem with one of her. Yeah, we did dates. a, we always do a community garage sale, um, you know, which is a low money maker, which is fine, but we, you know, have found it beneficial and we always did it on a Saturday. And uh, we we just recently done one, but the one before that we did it on Sunday morning, and nobody came to it. So we didn't realize how much of an impact changing a date from a Saturday morning for community garage sale to a Sunday morning was going to have. But apparently on Sunday morning people are with their families, they're attending church or worship or doing whatever they want on a Sunday morning. So be you know aware of what's going on too in your community um, when you are planning events. Did you, did you give yourself enough time to plan your event? If you're planning an event that's, um, I'm just going to use a golf tournament, you can't expect to get 64 golfers together in two weeks. You can't say, well, this is great. I'm going to do a golf event, and we're going to do it in two weeks. You're not going to pull off 64 golfers in two weeks. You have to plan that. Think about it in the spring and give yourself several months to pull this together. Um, you just have to make sure that you're very organized and you have help and you know. Um, realistic. Yeah, just give yourself realistic goals to make your event pull off and be successful. There's cost involved when you are planning a fundraiser, whether it's simple stamps or uh, money for halls. Uh, you have to spend money to make money. And you can recoup this if you choose out of what you make out of your money, out of your fundraiser. You can uh, say you make $5,000 and you had to spend $1,000 to pull your fundraiser off. You can take that $1,000 out of your um, money that you've raised or if you choose, you can donate, make that your donation back to the cause. It's up to you. Some people can afford to do that, some people can't. So, but just know that you're going to have to have some upfront money in order to pull a fundraiser off, whether it's hall rentals or buying prizes or whatever, you're gonna have to spend money. Organize, organization. This is probably should have been almost number one on the list. You have to have organizational skills, and if you're not good at it, find somebody who is um, to help you. You have to keep track of your contracts, your deadlines, set things um, up for yourself so you know that in three weeks you want to be checking with your vendors, you know, um, keep your receipts organized. If somebody has a contract that you can pull it out and say, wait a minute, you said this and this and this was included. You just want to make sure that you're always organized when you're setting this stuff up and uh, your event will go much smoother. Okay, step three, choosing a venue. I'm going to kind of march through these and then I'll discuss the pictures with you. We have rental costs, location is key, the size, obtaining a venue con to contact, reading the fine print, and other considerations like permits, alcohol, food, police, and road closures. When you are looking for a venue, not only is it important to be realistic, but think outside the box a little bit. For example, when we do poker, one of the middle picture is actually at my house. We looked into renting a hall and you know doing it at another venue, but it was going to be between five hundred and a thousand dollars. Why do I want to throw that away? So let's move some furniture aside if we can fit all the poker players in the house, or if a friend can donate their house or a venue that can donate and have your rent there. That way you're not putting any costs up front, you know, just for the venue. 
So think if you can access people that you know that can donate a hall or facility. I think Latanya Manuel just did one of her first fundraisers and she was able to work out something with people she knew in her area in Michigan to get her hall donated. So think about that. Think if there's people that you know that are able to donate that so you don't have to have that cost up front. Um, also, other considerations with the permits and alcohol and food and police, especially if you're doing a walk or a race or a run. I know permits take forever sometimes. Um, Erica, who's one of our board members, another Erica, was waiting forever for her permit just to come in for her race. So something to consider when you're planning is sometimes the city can take a long time for those types of things. So you definitely want to give yourself enough time when you're planning to get those things into place. Asking for support. Ask for support early in the process, like the, immediately when you decide that you're going to have a fundraiser, you want to make sure that you're um, getting support early. And that also includes from the foundation. They will provide you with a 5013C letter, <clears throat> which shows that you're a tax exempt um, organization, which will help you buy things without having to pay taxes on them. Um, seek out donations from businesses and acquaintances. I had my whole um, quarter mania, every single bit of food was donated for 200 people. And that was drinks and full dinner, dessert and everything. Um, the thing that you guys all have to get over is a fear of being told no. Mm -hmm. um, I can't. I, I'm going to talk about that too. When she's done, I completely agree 100%. Um, you'll be surprised how few times you're actually told no. It's, it's a fear that you have, and if you get told no, it's okay. And then you can shame them actually into then saying yes, <laughs> which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. <laughs> but if you, but if you. You know, especially if you go in with that 5013C letter and it's a cancer-related um, disease and you tell them your story, uh, you know, that you're battling this disease or you've lost your husband or your child or you're bad, you know, it's pretty darn hard for them to say, mm, sorry, no. But, and there's other companies that actually have these funds available available all the time. Target, Sam's, Walmart. I mean, they have card, $25 gift cards that they just will give you. I mean, they, it, they just do. So you just have to go in, fill out a form, give them a copy of this letter, and you get these gift cards. It's that easy. Um, Donations can be requested in many forms, in person, email, and phone. I say that, but in person is mm -hmm. the best. Key. It's key. Yeah. Ask friends, family, and coworkers to volunteer at your event, um, and also ask them for donations, because everybody has connections. Um, all my desserts were donated from a friend of a friend, and it was amazing, I couldn't believe it. it was all cheesecakes and they were so elaborate and cookies and it, they were very good. And um, it was all donated from a friend of a friend. So I didn't even have to ask that person. So it was even better. Um, so that's looking for networking opportunities. Reach out to the Miso Foundation for questions and ask your law firm to match donations um, and can, uh, contributions. You can, um, your law firms have made a lot of money off of your cases. Don't be afraid to ask them for, if you're doing a run, ask them if they'll help buy your t-shirts. Or, or for more. Or, yeah. <laughs> or for more, as Erica is going to tell you how brave she is when it comes to her law firm. Um, but don't be afraid to ask them to, I mean, if, if you made 15000 say, if I, if I raise 15000 will you match it? 
Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but you have to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. Piggyback, yeah, piggybacking on what Shelly's saying um, with don't be afraid to ask. You know, you're not going to be any better off or worse off than where you were anyway. Don't be afraid to ask if they say no. So who cares? Move on. Or like I was saying before, you can shame them into it. Um, recently at our poker events, we do between 25 and 30 raffles. So we have people from all over our community, businesses, you know, that donate, even big, big businesses, Cheesecake and Target and, and, you know, huge places. So when I was collecting donations across our community, I went to our local grocery store, who I don't want to say the name, but I did go there and I said, you know, where's our where's our uh, donation for this, this raffle? And they said, oh, you know, no, we can't do it this year. And I go, what do you mean? And she said, oh, we were told that, you know, we're already giving to the Miso Foundation. I go, trust me, if you're not giving to the Miso Foundation, if you were donating to mesothelioma, I would know it, and it's not happening. So <laughs> I said, you know, call corporate and go find out what's going on. So she goes, the general manager's great and knows our family, calls corporate, I waited, and they said, you know, we're just, you know, she's like, I'm sorry, she just said that we don't give to that particular charity. I go, really? I go, well, go tell them that every other business in this shopping center has made a donation to this event, which was true. Every single business at this prominent shopping center made a donation except for this store. And I said, go tell them that. She went back. When she came back, she goes, here you go. And she, they made a donation. Because they didn't want to be the only ones in the community that were left out and then looked bad that they didn't care to support a cause. So there's always ways to get around things, even if people say no. A perfect time also to get donations, if you're at a restaurant and you want to maybe get a gift card from a restaurant for a raffle, when you're sitting there with your family or your husband or wife or whomever and you're eating a $30, $40 meal and then you say to you know, the, the waiter or the general manager or someone you know, hey, I'm doing this event, would you mind donating $25? It's very hard for them to say no when you're sitting in their restaurant spending $50 on a meal. So also use the situations you know, to your advantage. And finally, I do want to talk about um, the matching with the law firms. For me and my family, that has been huge um, and so helpful for the funds that we've raised. When I decided to do this, you know, four years ago after we lost dad, um, I went and told them what I wanted to do. And I, I went to the attorney and I said, you know, I'm going to raise $25,000. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, no, you're going to match me. And he's like, excuse me? And I said, look, I go, let's be, let's be honest here. You're wealthy and rich. You have planes, trains, and automobiles. Why don't you really give back to the people that are hurting? Why don't you really try to help patients? Why don't you really try to help people like my dad who passed away and give back to research? I said, I'm going to raise $25,000, and I want you to match me and give me $25,000. And he said, okay. And, you know, I think, you know, talking to them on that type of level of being able to say, look, you guys kind of have it all. Kick back some to help these people. It's worked. And I've gone back again. And I said, I'm going to raise 50, and I want you to match me. And they said, OK. And to date, they've given um, the, me and our family in memory of my dad $75,000 by matching. And they continue to be so helpful. So if you need help talking to your law firms, if you want some guidance, I'm here to help. I'll go with you, you know, and, 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 and get them to really contribute, you know, to research and the patients and why we're all here. Okay, step five, including a moneymaker. Most of these are straightforward. I'm sure you've heard about them, 50-50s, silent auction, live auction, high ticket items, baskets, apparel, mugs and pens, uh, jello shots, which could be fun, and, <laughs> um, and, uh, and drawings. Um, looking at the pictures that are up there, in the middle is the, or top, is the uh, raffle that we have at poker. We have about 40 people that usually sit down and play poker, but we have over 70 people that just come and watch. So I have over 100 people attending. I want to give something to the other people that are there. So we're able to do raffles, and we get around 30 
uh, donations for raffle items. So we're calling names and numbers every 10 minutes, which is fun. People can make a donation and leave with something. So, you know, definitely think about incorporating that into your event. It's so easy and it also gives, you know, people the ability to donate. Um, and no one buys, you know, no one says to me, how much is a ticket, a dollar? I mean, I put it up like three for five or seven for 10, but people write checks, you know, $25, 50. At our last poker tournament, I had someone write me a check for the raffle for $500. So, you know, I think after that night, we walked away with 4,000 just made on raffle. So, you know, think about that when you're doing events. Um, and the bottom picture is actually spur, something that happens spur of the moment. We had someone that came and donated a painting, um, and we did a live auction, and we raised a few hundred dollars, and it was fun, and you know, just something to think about too when you're um, putting these events together. This is crucial, saying thank you. Thank all those who donated their time, money, and resources. This includes um, the people who helped you physically at your um, event. Thank businesses who uh, made, if you thank the businesses who made donations, this will make asking next year that much easier. A lot of times when you go back next year to the mom and pops for a donation, they are so willing to help that um, sometimes they don't even ask you for your paperwork anymore because they know you now and they're willing right. to just I, make I a donation. I go to this one, um, it's called Fratelli's, it's a little mom and pop uh, Italian restaurant and they donate two pans of mustacholi every year for um, the quarter mania and they, they don't even hesitate and they always give me a gift certificate too. So. Thanking them is, is a huge, um, thanking everybody is, a, is, is just huge. Share your success story and tell your story to, um, to them as well. Let them know how much money you raised and how successful your event was. You can put it on Facebook, blogs, social media, letters, whatever to get your story out there. Um, it's not only that, but it also lets people know more about the disease and what you're doing. So um, I just think the biggest thing, this is probably, I, we just, both of us probably agree, this is, you can't say enough about saying thank you to people um, because it's just not only the right thing to do, but it's gonna make next year so much easier when you go back to these places they're going to remember you and be that much more willing to give. And maybe they'll give more once they see um, your success and how thankful you are that they, uh, can, you know, that they contributed and made your event successful. Something I found that's useful too, besides going in and saying thank you, is um, I, this picture that's up there is two boards from poker tournaments. Since we had about 30 businesses that donated, I don't know if you can make out all the logos, but you know we had Starbucks, we had Hard Rock, we had Cheesecake Factory, we had big businesses. So when I wanted to go in and, and say thank you, I actually took this picture into them and let them know I even had their logo up throughout the entire event. So that also makes them happy that I had their logo up and at the poker tournament people were seeing it. And, you know, I just say thanks. And it makes it so much easier. I can't stress enough, like Shelly said, going back next year, sometimes they go, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. And they're just giving you the gift certificates. They're giving you what you need. You don't even need your information, you know, anymore from the foundation. It's just so beneficial to keep it moving forward. Something new we're doing um, for 2013, a new project and development that I've been working on with some people and I'm really excited about it, is Mission Cure Miso. Mission Cure Miso is now gonna be our umbrella term um, for all of our events. So as we march forward, we're gonna all be part of Mission Cure Miso fundraising events. So anytime you do a fundraiser, we'll have this tagline, which will help identify our brand and what we're trying to do in the community. And second, we have music for Miso. 
Um, this is something that I've thought about for over a year and have been speaking to Mary and Melinda about it, and we're finally gonna kind of launch it here. We have so many wonderful musicians in our community. You're gonna hear them tonight in the band, and um, we're gonna start to have musical benefits for mesothelioma. So I'm very excited about that. I'm gonna host the first one in South Florida um, where I got a band to almost donate their time. Turns out the law firm that I was telling you about earlier that represented my dad, oh, they also own a restaurant. So I said, okay, I want that too. So they're gonna donate their, they're, they're gonna donate the restaurant. Um, and I've been speaking even with people about it here and I'm very excited about people doing it in other areas. I think Bruce Jackson mentioned he might do one, the Lagana family. And I've been in touch with uh, Liam Pendarvis, who's also on the board, but not here. He's a musical uh, conductor for Saturday Night Live. And he is going to be speaking with me about hopefully planning one in New York City, which could be huge um, out there. So I'm very excited about these two new developments. And if you know people that may want to do this and be involved in music for me, so please let me know. So now we're going to... We're going to turn it over to Q&A. Yes. So if you have a question, Melinda will bring around a mic, and hopefully we can answer it. <laughs> you can go out there if you want and use it. Oh, you were talking about the uh, music for Mezzo. What are you doing? I mean, wh what? how are you raising the money? Are you having, I don't understand. Okay, um, music for me, so, you know, we don't have anything that's our own, that we can just brand that is our own. So that's kind of how this idea got started, especially with the, you know, the musicians that we have involved, especially with Penn being involved uh, with a, you know, in New York with the Saturday Night Live band. So the way it's gonna work is depending on how the venue's gonna operate. Usually musical benefits like that, you will usually get a, either at the door, you'll have a door fee of when you enter, and then you can also get a cut of the, of the food and beverage throughout the night. You can also have auctions going on, you can have speakers, you know, things like that happening throughout the night. It's gonna be like an upscale kind of dinner party or cocktail party. So depending on what venue you're gonna be with and who you're gonna be working with is gonna dictate how much money and where you're gonna charge to, for your money to be kicked out. But in the end, when you send out invitations and you're inviting people, they know they're coming to make a donation. So that'll be on top of if you're gonna get money kicked out for food and beverage and you know to be able to enter in the door. Okay. Does that make sense, Mary Jane? Yes, okay. yes, thank you. Anybody else have questions about any of our events? Does anyone want to know? Okay, Erica. <laughs> do either of you do events where like a walk or a race where people have to ask people to sponsor them? And I'm wondering if anyone has any, I, I've been doing it like a race for, not a race, but a walk for eight years. And it's sometimes tough to get like, my friends will come and be like, yeah, I'm gonna come and give like their donation and their registration fee, but then it's like, I want everyone to try to raise like $1,000 each, you know? And it's like, it ends up being only a handful of people, like 10 or 20 people that do that. But I don't know if anyone has any advice on like motivating people who are your friends, but aren't like as affected by the disease as mm -hmm. let's say I am to really go out there and either recruit or get themselves sponsored. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone has any Should advice anyone on talk that. About that. Do you have, um, have you tried having them get have you had them try to get sponsors? In yeah, order to and get I do have, like, we do it online now, too, but we do it online and with actual sponsor sheets. So, I mean, last year we had $10,000 in online fund, like, um, sponsor. People raised $10,000 online for themselves, plus, like, 15000 offline. So, it's successful. I just want it to be more. I want to raise You know how money. sometimes they have, um, like, the little thermometer thing where each, each racer, each race, uh, yeah, person has a goal of a hundred dollars or whatever, five hundred dollars, where they send that out via email or Facebook or whatever. Yeah. Have you tried that? Yeah, I mean it's there because it's just the same like module that everyone where you have a thermometer, you know, whatever the the goal, and it kind of moves up. And like I say, there's like a there's like a core group of people that will do it online and will raise like a thousand dollars each person or you have teams and try to make it a competition. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to like motivate people a little bit yeah. more to do it. 
and I just don't know how. So I, I just want it to be like, I want to exceed obviously what I did last year you, and what we've done. We've just kind right. of stagnated around 25 grand for each event, and I want to like, and I have a raffle. I think that's pretty good, Erica. $25,000 no, yeah, for that's each really event. Good. <laughs> no, but I want to you could actually that. do something where you could almost make the teams almost compete against each other. So in a way, if you had, you know, four different teams that were going to try to raise $1,000, maybe you could give out an incentive. Yeah, I thought about to, that, about to, doing a prize. Yeah, like the to a prize, team. you know, whatever it is. And, you know, it could be some, you know, drawing back and forth between the teams of who's going to be able to raise the most money. I think yeah. you need to provide an incentive yeah. in that aspect to get them to commit and raise more money. Well, right. I was going to say, do you um, have a sponsor like Foot Locker or... or um... No, because, I mean, we have law firms that sponsor us, so two law firms that sponsor us in the, that are in the area. Um, so they gave a, a good deal of money behind it, but it's tough because it's not a race. So it's like Foot Locker is, I don't think, going to sponsor us. Or but you can try other money. incentives or donations, yeah, you know, gonna, that you can get, you know, a dinner out or something like that, and it'll be more of a competition yeah. and amongst each raffles, other. And I raffles, like I do raffles. So I got, like, New York Sports Club to donate a membership. I have, you know, Starbucks doing gift baskets for us and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just trying to figure out, like, what the incentive would be. If I'm not, like, again, like, if I'm not... Like, it's easy for me and my sisters and my mom and, like, our families and other families mm -hmm. to go out there and do it. But I have a lot of, if you have 150 people coming to a race, I want right. all 150 giving more than the $30. Well, we actually, when we, do, when we do hockey, because um, a lot of the guys that come and play, too, that didn't know my dad, we do a, ca we do a cash prize at the end. So they get a okay. gift certificate to, you know, get more hockey equipment, but then we give the guys cash, and some of them like that. So maybe, too, even doing something like that, you know, right. because in the end, you'll raise more money by them competing against each other than the money you kick out in a cash incentive. Right. So something to think about. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions out there in the, in the audience over here? Hi, my name is Sarah, and I just wanted to add on to this discussion. For the, um, I'm on the Miles for Miso committee for the Alton race that the Simmons firm sponsors, and exactly what you're talking about is what we've been dealing with for a long time because everybody says, oh, we'd love to come and do a team event, but it's so hard to get people, like just to provide that incentive and to get people to go and figure out. So I've actually been researching it recently, and I found out it has a name. It's called peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, and there's actual software out there that you can go and get that will help you build those types of teams and get people motivated. So that might be something to look into, um, especially, and, and I'm talking with a company right now that does the same type of thing for the Step Out Walk for the, the, uh, the, the American Diabetes Association. And so it, it, it looks really great, and I think it might work for us, but you know, your event's probably, it's not a walk, so th maybe there's something else out there that could help you with that as well. Good, good. Yeah, great point, that's well taken. Anybody else at Sarah? Um, it's just more of a general suggestion. Um, one of the things that my company does every few weeks, I guess, is we have Jeans Friday. So you have to pay $5 mm -hmm. or $10 mm -hmm. to wear jeans in the office for the day. Mm -hmm. And it's just things like that. We're tapping in, I think, like you guys said already, to the group that you already have, like the surfers, appeal to surfers. So if you're in an office setting where they do that, or maybe they don't do that, but they'd be willing to start it, um, it might be another way that, again, that's minimal effort on you. It's probably HR. You know, you go to HR and turn it over to them, and they print flyers or send out emails. Again, it might not be that much money if you don't work in a huge office, but if you do it on a consistent basis, once a quarter or something like that, it might mm. be just a good way to both fundraise mm. and get the awareness out. You know, yeah. people are getting this, if your company is 100 people getting an email about, we're wearing jeans to raise funds for the MISO Foundation, mm -hmm. that gives you that platform again to just kind of talk about the foundation. And no, and Sarah, you, you bring up a good point. We do actually have dress down days. Um, we had um, someone recently do that at their work in a corporate office, and so they wore blue jeans. I think they raised around four or $500. And I actually have been speaking, too, with uh, Alexa Bendix, 
um, um, and their families here in the audience, and doing a dress down day at the daughter's high school because they wear a uniform. So she said, you know, she remembers she always wanted to dress down too and get out of that uniform. So that can also be very successful even in schools, having a dress down day, being able to get out of your uniform, or if you do wear your regular clothes, doing a silly hat day, silly socks, you can get, um, you know, even the local schools involved if you have kids or families that are able to do that. And something too that's been successful in our area is a food truck event as well, where you have a local food truck that comes um, to the schools where you're able to, um, they sell food and you get a kickback from, from that as well. So those are some different things that I've been recently speaking about on a school level um, that is also beneficial and is working for people. Something I wanted to uh, mention is um, company matches too. If you make a donation at, from work, if you make a $200 donation, some up to, I know my sister, she makes $250 donation from her work, her company will match that donation. So you might want to check at work and see if your company will match donations um, to charities. So if you have sons or daughters, or if you still work or whatever, that's something that you might want to look into too, is uh, company matches. Good point. I know too with our donations, we receive company matches all the time, which um, is great. And you, you know, let the donor know that that, you know, that that's something that they can do. And um, you know, 150 now is 300 dollars. So something again that's that's easy and simple. Is there any other questions or yes, Heather? Okay. So how do you go about getting all the food donated for your events? Just Both of ask. us have been successful. You want to talk first about that? Well. First of all, if you go to some place regularly, um, you just talk to the manager or the owner first. That's where you start. You go. To, you don't talk to the waitress because she has no pull. You have to go to um, the owner, and you take your 5013C letter. I went to Olive Garden. Olive Garden donated all the salads. The salads and they actually gave me 25 huge salads. I mean, I was throwing them, I was giving them away. I was like, here, here, take a salad home. I mean, we used like 10 of them to feed. Um, Texas Roadhouse, they gave us all the rolls, rolls and honey butter for, so, I mean, it's, they're big stores. I mean, big restaurants, chains. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to mom and pops and that you might frequent and ask them. You can go to chicken places and ask if they'll, if they don't do all of them, ask if they'll donate 50 pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it doesn't have to be all of the same thing. People don't expect at a fundraiser to be fed, typically. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you, I'll give you a fair warning though, if you start feeding people, they're going to expect to get fed every time. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> because now of mine, they'll be like, what are you having this year? What are you, what are you, where, what are you having now? You know, we, so, we have an official party food already. Yeah, so, so you know, sub shops, they'll, they may donate, you know, a full, you know, one of the party subs. Um, you just, you really just go and you talk to the owner. Because if you talk to the little kid behind the counter, He's going to be like, eh, you know, take your name and lose it. Mm -hmm. So you have to go. <laughs> you have to go to the store manager. Um, is the best one. And if one tells you no, they're all independently owned. Yeah. You know. So. Or um, if you know somebody too. Right. I, so, yeah. Somebody who knows yeah. a, a restaurant owner, then that's that's the best. Or somebody will give you a fifty dollar gift certificate to. Oh, Charlie's or something. Use that $50 gift certificate and say, hey, can I buy a, you know, $50 worth of spaghetti? I'm, you know, you just have to be creative. I've been successful in poker um, that I went to Moe's because we know somebody there and they donated everything. 
So right. um, the friend, my one of my friend's husbands is one of the general managers. He owns about five of them. And he was able, with no problem, to donate all of that. Someone in our neighborhood I knew down the street worked in liquor. So I went to her one day. I wasn't even friends with her. I told her what I was doing. I had my papers. And her company was able to donate all the wine and all the mixing and everything, which you guys know is expensive. So just ask. And, and talk to people and see who knows who. For poker, our grand prize even this year was a two-night stay at Shula's. You know, that came through um, my sister-in-law, sister-in-law's mother who knew somebody. So don't be afraid to kind of put your feelers yeah, network, out there. Network, 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 network. Network, network to see who Start will early. help. I'll tell you, one year, Bob Evans did everything from, they did the whole turkey dinner all the way through to the pies. You guys are talking about alcohol because that's actually really important because if you get people a little tipsy They're gonna be more willing to part with money. Yeah, yeah. and it's true. You're I mean even beyond asking people that you know Find your find your local Anheuser-Busch distributor mm -hmm. The first fundraiser I ever did for the Miso Foundation in 2002 I got in touch with someone who knew someone who knew someone whose dad worked right. I called them up. They said How much do you need? They sent me some, like 50 cases of beer. Right. I recently were actually doing a fundraiser next month and I contacted a winery that I had met the owner once mm -hmm. through an organization I was involved in. I got an email back fairly quickly where they're sending me a case of wine. I'm hoping they'll send two. Mm -hmm. After that, I got an email from somebody else saying, oh, we're really sorry. We don't have any, you know, about the donations. And then he said, the original guy sent an email, no, 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 Bill, who owns the winery, mm -hmm. Bill, Bill's already sending them wine, it's right. cool. So part of it is just ask. The worst 100%. thing anyone will say is no. Right. Who and in here? I was, oh, sorry. But I'm saying the liquor distributors, they're really good people to go after. So if you know someone who owns a restaurant or a bar, you go to one, ask them who their, who their mm -hmm. liquor distributor is. Mm -hmm. And get in touch with them directly because it's a write-off for those companies. It's mm -hmm. advertising. It does it, it, they're happy to give that stuff away. They want their product in people's hands. So make sure you liquor people up at your events. No, and it's true. I mean, it's she's kind of making light of it, but it's funny. It's I mean, true. even at poker, when people are drinking, yeah, I'll go in, yeah. I was like, you want a rebuy? Oh, yeah, sure, okay, that's another $25. I mean, it's true. Yeah. You know, and when people are happy and hanging out and they're eating, they're more likely to, you and know. And they'll stay longer. And they'll, they'll stay longer, they spend more money, which, you know, benefits your event. So, and they're happy and they come back again. So um, it is important. And actually, I just want to say for, for the fundraiser we're doing for my mom, I'm fortunate enough to have one of my very dear friend's brother as a very, very well-known chef. And I said, can we do something at your restaurant? And he said, yeah, whatever you want. We'll, we'll, I'll just do everything for you at cost. And you, if you try to get wine donated so we don't have to pay for it, that's even better. But yeah, no problem. Yeah. So like, they, like they've been saying, ask people because you'll be surprised how many say yes. And when you put that personal touch, I want to just mention something. When you walk in and tell your story, when I go tell people that I lost my dad to mesothelioma, it's very hard for someone to say, oh, okay, I don't care. I'm not going to help you. I mean, when you walk in person and explain what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish, it is so difficult for someone to turn away. By sending emails um, and not going in person, mistake. It is so much easier to walk in person and say, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, please help me. And it is effective and it works. Well, and if you can't, if they, a lot of companies or stores like Target and stuff like that will make you write a letter and submit it at the counter. But so you still have to write your story down, write it with as much passion as you would speak it and submit it with your 5013C letter and you won't be turned down. I'm telling you, you won't be turned down. I think last year I was told no one time. Right. And we know what one happened time. when I was told no one time at the grocery store, so. <laughs> you know, you're just not told no. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you're talking to people who have human hearts and mm -hmm. are compassionate. I wanted to ask somebody in the audience, how many of you are interested in fundraising but are afraid to do it. Can you raise your hand? Are, Mom, are, this so, this group, this I, no, don't be afraid. You can raise, I mean, Mary Jane. So you're interested in fundraising. You just don't know how. You're afraid to make that first step. So, so think about for somebody you're afraid. like. 
Yes. Right. Start, can you start over so that people at home can hear you your know question? You when you go to the grocery store, you see all of those little clovers or something, you donate a dollar for right. leukemia or whatever. Do you guys do that kind of thing or do can we do that kind of thing? You can. If Is your that, grocery store will allow you, usually there's strict regulations with who, what they can do, whether it's, you know. And boys usually and, that's MDA. Boys and Girls Club, you know, something that's, you know, recognized across the board. Go and try 100% if you can. Because but it is time, hard to get into that. Every time I'm at the grocery store, there's some other cost. So I'm wondering how they get into that, you know. How do they... It's Those usually a nationally or worldwide recognized organization, um, and they've gone through a lot of red tape themselves to be able to do that. But if you see something like that and you know a person or you want to speak to a general manager, we, Shelly or I can talk to you about how we can help you get in there and at least ask and see what happens. Because okay. we could do like the blue ribbon. Yeah, something. We could do yeah, like a like blue that. ribbon like for our symbol and get those printed off and into your hands, but I don't know if we could... Well, we can work with you on yeah. it, yeah. so we're willing to. How are we doing on time, Melinda? Are we, we're wrap it up? Okay, thank you guys so much. Um, we're gonna take some questions after, and if you guys have any questions off to the side, you know, let us know, we're willing to help you. Please contact us, please reach out. That's what we're here for, that's our mission. And we also have the pictures up here of some of our events if you'd like to uh, see them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.